from Built It Productions, it's The Great Creators. Conversations about creativity with some of the most celebrated actors, musicians, and performers of our time. I'm Guy Raz, and on the show today, Boingo Boingo frontman and film composer Danny Elfman. How getting panned by music critics time and time again only fueled his ambitions. Some LA critic wrote, a dance band for kids who can't dance. And I thought that was a great line. You know, you can't pay for that kind of advertising. Danny Elfman is one of the most prolific and recognizable film composers in the business. He's written music for many of Tim Burton's films like Pee-wee's Big Adventure, Big Fish, and Beetlejuice. He wrote the theme to The Simpsons and composed music for blockbusters like Batman, the first three Spider-Man films, and Men in Black. And Danny's winding path to get there, it almost feels like it was pulled from a Tim Burton movie. In his late teens, Danny joined his brother in a traveling circus. He performed in the streets of southern France, and then eventually came back to California and brought that eccentric energy to the stage with his band Oingo Boingo. In this episode, you'll hear how Danny picked up a violin and taught himself to play by ear, how he overcame crippling stage fright by performing barefoot and shirtless, and just throwing himself into the frenzy of the crowd. And you'll also hear how he keeps reinventing himself. At 69 years old, Danny Elfman is composing classical music and recording and performing rock songs for a whole new generation of fans. That's all coming up after this short break. Hey, before we get back to the show, just a quick announcement. If you're listening in the car or on a smart speaker and you have young kids in range, just a heads up that there are a few swear words in this episode in case you want to listen later with headphones or without the kids nearby. But I definitely hope you keep listening either way. Okay, thanks so much and on with the show. Danny Elfman grew up in Los Angeles in the 1950s and early 60s. Both of his parents were school teachers, and Danny's first love was movies, but not just any movies, monster movies. I was a monster kid, yeah. not just really that simple. You know, growing up on monsters, I lived down the street from a movie theater in Los Angeles in this area called Baldwin Hills. And that was my church, my synagogue growing up was yeah. that theater because I was there every weekend of my childhood. And as kids, if it wasn't sci-fi, horror, or fantasy, we had no interest, Wow. period. Mary Poppins comes out, no interest. I mean, <laughs> zero. And, um, you know, there had to be monsters or zombies or mutants or at least fantastical battles of ancient armies of some sort uh, in order to pull us into the theater. The cool thing growing up as a movie kid, a monster kid in those days, is there was such a plethora to choose from because what I didn't understand at the time is the movies that we were seeing every week, they'd have two new movies. And so to come up with this huge amount of content for the kids, um, they pulled from all over the world and from different eras. So for example, I saw when I was about 11 years old, The Day the Earth Stood Still. And I think that's where I really noticed film music and Bernard Herrmann. Yeah. I didn't know at the time that that movie was 12 years old. It actually was released the year I was born. <laughs> but for me, when I was 12, that was a new movie playing in the theater. As you sort of got a bit older, I know your brother is four years older than you, Richard, and he went off to San Francisco to kind of hang out and, and you know, what, the Summer of Love or wherever, whatever it was. You were in high school, um, and I know that, that at, like, age 17, you picked up the violin and started to mess around with it, but you weren't formally trained. What was your ambition? Like, did you, what did you think you were going to do when you were 17, 18 years old? Well, I mean, up till the age of 16, I was set on becoming a, a radiation biologist, something like that. I mean, that's what I did. You know, I went to summer special science courses and, you know, I built my own Geiger counter. And wow. I actually, if you can believe this, had uh, three different kinds of radioactive isotopes in my room <laughs> that I would do experiments <laughs> on, including, by the way, 
radioactive test site sand wow. that any kid could buy directly from the Atomic Energy Commission. You just sent in an application. They send you a bag of radioactive, radioactive sand. sand. Wow. Yeah. So the fact that I'm alive, <laughs> for one thing, is already incredible. Because yeah. later on, I said, oh, I'm never going to fucking live past 40. No, it's with all that radiation happen. in your bedroom, no. Exactly. So <laughs> that was my youth. Now, when I got to high school, everything changed because my parents moved between middle school and high school. I went to a new neighborhood. I'm starting from scratch, new friends, new everything. I, you know, I had to go to a school where I didn't know a soul. Yeah. And the new friends that I made all happened to be artists and musicians. And it's just a group I fell in with. Hmm. And I really only am a musician now and got into music because of this group of friends. Wow. Because of that. Yeah. Because they all played stuff. And, um, you know, my girlfriend at that time went off and founded Sonic Youth. Kim Gordon. You know, she was your girlfriend yeah, in high school. My first girlfriend. <laughs> it's amazing. And so it was an interesting group. And um, it was just a whole new world for me. And it's like, to me, these friends, now that's what I wanted to be part yeah. of, you know? And so I figured it was too late for me to become a musician. Here I am, 17, and I've never played an instrument. And they all been playing since they were seven, right? Yeah. So I figured my, the ship has sailed. It's too late. But I was planning a year around the world with a friend of mine. And we both decided to pick up instruments. And the reason for that is my gang, my group, we used to go to an Indian restaurant in Venice when we were young. And they used to play Django Reinhardt uh, music. It's called La Hot Club of France. And it's 1930s jazz with this incredible mm -hmm. gypsy guitarist named Django Reinhardt yep. and a violinist named Stefan Grappelli. And I remember thinking, man, I would love to play violin like Stefan Grappelli. And I never will, but I'm going to take an instrument with me. So we both brought these instruments and we spent the year traveling and just kind of learning, goofing around and jamming. You so, know? so the idea was you would finish high school and, and sort of travel and figure it yeah. out. And, and part of that was you would maybe be a busker like a, along the way, maybe play, play like on the streets. Well, I, I didn't imagine that, but that's what happened. Right. But you just picked up the violin and just start tinkering with it? Because a, it's a complex yeah. instrument. I mean, this is no, why No, I just kids, started tinkering. Yeah. You know, it just, and, and how quickly did, did you become proficient? Well, I mean, on one hand, I never did become proficient because <laughs> I never became a great violinist. On the other hand, I picked it up really quickly because five months after I picked it up, I found myself en route to Africa in Paris with my brother. Where he lived and he was performing. You with went group to Paris to go on travel, just to see my brother. And to see your brother. On the way, but your yeah, plan he, was to go to Africa. But exactly. And this is your brother Richard. What was he doing there? He was uh, performing with a musical theatrical troupe called the Grand Magic Circus, and I just thought that's so cool. My brother is like playing conga drums with the Grand Magic Circus. And this is like 1970, 71, right? Two. Seventy-two. Yeah. Okay. I visit my brother. And I was practicing one day, and I didn't know that the director of the troupe had come in. And I came out, and he said, why don't you come on the road with us? You can play. And I go, wow. no, nah, I can't play. He goes, yeah, you're good enough for us. I go, really? And I went on the road with Le Grand Magic Circus as a fiddle player. All, and, all over uh, France? Southern France, yeah. And what, and, what did uh, they do? What was Le Grand Magic Circus? It, it's hard to explain. It was insane <laughs> theatrical circus with musical numbers. People would play and sing and do like really vulgar theater. <laughs> there was just different people, as I recall, just kind of played a little of this and a little of that. An actor might pick up a guitar and play. Somebody at a certain point might start singing a song and they'd ask me, just play along with the song. And I'd go, okay. And um, in Nice, France, I bought uh, a mandolin. I was carrying that around with me, and I kind of wrote a little song on it, and the director liked it, and he said, you start the show. Wow. And I, I sat down in front of like a thousand people a night playing this little tune I wrote on a mandolin. I'd never written, I, yeah, I didn't, I'd only been playing for weeks, really. And um, he made me open the show with it. It was terrifying, wow. but it was my first performing, and uh, it kind of reset my trajectory. 
All right, so you do end up going to West Africa. Yeah, but it was a altered trip because before we went to Africa, we ended up in the Canary Islands because a friend in the Grand Magic Circus told me, oh, you got to go visit Lanzarote. We went there and we made friends there and they started telling us about this place called Mali, which I'd never heard of, by the way. It wasn't on the plan. Mm. And seeing statues and fetishes that they brought back from Mali. And next thing I know, I'm getting obsessed with Mali. And so... We just altered the whole trip. Instead of going to North Africa and going over to India and Asia, we turned right instead of left and went inland through the Mauritanian desert to the country called Mali. And uh, I just became really interested in Mali. And Malian music is amazing. Yeah. So I ended up living with Leon in Bamako, Mali, and like listening to music being played all night long and... We would sometimes take out our instruments and jam with players on local instruments. It was an amazing time, but it was unplanned. It was totally not part of the meticulously charted out trip that we were going to take. Instead of going through India and Asia, we went, like I said, the other direction. We went through Mali, now down through Senegal, down to the coast of Ghana, traveled along to Zaire, crossed over Zaire to uh, Uganda and Kenya. And then by the time I got to Kenya, I was diagnosed with hepatitis. I was like, you know what? I like, I'm ready to come home. Yeah. It was like, it was the kind of like the final straw. So you get back, I think it's what, like 1972. Your brother had, from from what I understand, he had formed a, like a street theater performance Yeah, troupe. I mean, he started his own spinoff of Le, Le Grand Magic Circus called The Mystic Knights of the Oingo Boingo. This was in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles. And he used to send me, I picked up letters in Africa from him. And he goes, started this troupe, the Mystic Knights, you're going to love it. You have to come back and join us. When are you coming home? And I'd write him back and I'd say, I don't think it'll be another six months. You know, I hope there's still something left for me to do. And when I got back home with hepatitis, I remember he picked me up the first day. He drove over and he says, I'm going to take you to rehearsal. I know you have hepatitis. You don't have to do anything. Just sit and watch and kind of absorb. I said, all right, I guess uh, I don't get much downtime here. <laughs> yeah. I was really put to work the f- day one. So b- what was the Mystic Knights of the Oingo Boingo? Where did that name come from? Oh, you'd have to ask my brother where the name came from. Oingo Boingo was a made-up name. I think it was like a variation of like something off of a cover of Zap Comics. You know, yeah. we, they were really, really, as I was, really into these underground comics in the 60s called Zap with uh, Robert Crumb and all these other artists. And the Mystic Knights, I think it it was derived from a radio show, Amos and Andy, where they had a a lodge called the Mystic Knights of the Sea. Right. And so I think they combined the Mystic Knights of the Sea and came up with Oingo Boingo, and that was the name. I mean, just hearing about your brother and how he was sort of saying, when are you coming back? And clearly you, you... form this collaborative relationship because your brother is also this super creative person. Yeah. I mean, look, he had faith in me in the beginning. He's like, you're going to be the musical director of this troupe, period. End of story. Right. And uh, there's nothing else to decide. By the time I got back, I thought they'd had a, a show going. I didn't know if there'd be something for me to do. It was just a street band. I mean, literally. What was it? it what was, did they do? It would start with a huge parade of drums. Okay. And I think there was about eight or ten and when where? we started. Where we finally became it? 12. Anywhere. Everywhere. In, Movie in, lines. Okay. Uh, art museums. <laughs> the idea is we would like burst into a crowd, wherever there's a crowd of people, um, with drums, and then pull out our instruments and do like a 15-minute show, pass the hat, and get out before the police came. Wow. And uh, fire breathers, acrobats, I mean, the works. I I learned to be a fire breather, so there were two of us uh, blowing fire. My brother had a rocket ship with a fire extinguisher aimed at people, so if we started little fires on people's (laughs) heads or sweaters, he'd blast them really quick with CO2. It was that kind of ridiculous craziness and, and this was like really purely for for joy and art like you this was not a money-making venture <laughs> no it, you know we'd pass the hat and we'd maybe make enough to eat and that was about it so i had to wait tables and bus tables to pay the rent but but meantime i also read because up until this point from what i understand you could not read or write music you actually taught yourself how to do that how did you how did you do that? I taught myself to write, not to read. They're 
kind of two different things. Hmm. But I had to write because as the Mystic Knights started to improve their musicianship, which is what I was working on, like getting better players, we did a lot of old jazz and I wanted to get these arrangements absolutely correct. Well, there's no way to turn to for arrangements. So I started to teach myself how to transcribe music, Duke Ellington music, actually, to be specific. And I'd be listening to these Duke Ellington pieces that I really love from the early 30s. And I would transcribe all the parts. How did you figure out how to do that? I'm just, even just the notations, how did you? It, it's it's just mathematics. You know, you you learn to follow beats. And I learned that early on that I had a very good ear. Yeah. I can hear a phrase of music and freeze it long enough to like get all the parts down correctly and then you're breaking it into parts whether it's four four there's four beats eighth notes there's eight you know there's triplets it's just a bit of math and a very simple math at that so the harder part was learning to listen yeah and learning to find the notes that i was searching for chords harmonics and that was just listening just learning to listen writing it down wasn't hard listening yeah. was challenging. Because you were working at a restaurant in Santa Monica to earn some money. How formal was the practice? I mean, this was something clearly you were taking seriously because I read that like you started making instruments, like found objects and turning them into sounds. Like you were really, this was a real creative pursuit. Oh, it was a creative pursuit and it got more and more ambitious each year. So after about four years of streets, now we're starting to take it indoors. And uh, we started getting original friends that were artists to do animation, film clips. It became very, very ambitious. It was a crazy show. And I mean, it, it seems, I, I, should, I should say this right now, which is anybody listening to this can go and watch a clip. There's, uh, on YouTube, there's a clip of the Mystic Knights of the Oingo Boingo on the gong show with yeah, Chuck, Chuck Barris. Chuck Barris. Oh, please, please don't go and watch that. It but is amazing because no, there it you, is. it's amazing because there you see like there's a dragon and there are people playing instruments and there's a woman playing an uh, accordion keyboard accordion and you're in these aladdin pants in a rocket ship and it's so crazy it's like it is it's totally wild i mean it is it's this like explosion of weird creative yeah, energy i mean that that's still when we were a street band and so what you're seeing is like the street show but it's taken... awesome i mean yeah it's, but you're a kid it's awesome to see it all right, whatever. <laughs> For me, it's just embarrassing, but, but I will. But you can accept. see like all the people and they're working through weirdness. Like that's that's a thing. Like you were at a time in your life where you weren't clearly worried about being judged for making stuff that was bad because you were eventually no. you were working through different sounds. I mean, that's the only thing that stayed consistent throughout my entire life is not worrying about being judged because I've had four careers in my life. The Mystic Knights, the theater group, Oingo Boingo, the rock band, becoming a film composer, and then getting into classical composition yeah. where I'm you know, on my seventh or eighth commission piece right now. And the only thing consistent about all of them is that for the most part, I was panned upon the entrance of each field. And I began to really embrace that and enjoy that, you know. For the I, most I part, liked... the critics didn't like you from the at the beginning of every oh, endeavor. Oh no, like they they hated us. In the Mystic Nights, we would take our worst reviews and we would print them in our uh, our advertisements, our publicity. And in Oingo Boingo, it was the same thing, you know. Like some LA critic wrote, da "A dance band for kids who can't dance." And I thought that was a great line. You know, you can't pay for that kind of advertising. When we come back after a quick break, Danny Elfman trades in the world of avant-garde street theater to score his first film and then start a ska band. Stay with us. I'm Guy Raz, and you're listening to The Great Creators. Hey, welcome back to The Great Creators. I'm Guy Raz. So while Danny was hanging out in California with the Mystic Knights, he got an opportunity to work on one of his brother's films, playing the role of Satan and composing and performing his first film score. 
Your brother left the Mystic Knights of the Ongo Boingo to pursue a film career, and he made a film, which some people listening will know. It's a kind of a cult classic. It's been called the Citizen Kane of 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 underground movie. I can't remember what the what, the, but it's called Forbidden Zone. It came out in 1980, and he asked you to score the film. Now, this is your brother. Right. It was his film. It was not a wide release major, you know, motion picture, but it was still a film score that you. It was With the first the Mystic time. Nights, yeah. It was the first, it was the first time, time you were asked to exactly, score a film. to write for a film. And uh, even though it was with my own ensemble, it, it, it I definitely was trying to put in, uh, music to film, yeah. It's a super weird film. You're in it. You play Satan. And a super, super out there film. How did you – was was the tradition that you were writing in basically connected to what you were already doing with the Mystic Nights? Yeah. Was it, yeah. I mean, it, it was really actually right on the cusp of changing because the song I wrote for the title to the movie, um, Forbidden Zone, was the first time writing for electric instruments because yeah. the Mystic Nights, we didn't write for anything contemporary, no electronic instruments, no amplified guitars. It was all uh, brass band, string band, percussion band, but all acoustic and uh, nothing contemporary. And so it was right there at the end of the 70s where as I, I remember hearing ska mm. from England and going, oh, man, I'm, I dig this. I may just want to, like, throw this all away and start a band. And that was right when my brother was doing Forbidden Zone. So it was my first time using electric guitars and bass and drums. And uh, within a couple months of d- scoring the Forbidden Zone, Mystic Knights were gone. We let it go. Gone. Go. And, and from that would emerge, of course, Boingo, Boingo, Boingo. Boingo. Now, Which is so confusing because it's the same name, but there's no association to the right. Mystic Knights. It's just we were too, la- too lazy to get a new name, really. All right. This was, this was the start of, of you becoming famous. I mean, you be, and, and we'll get there in a moment, but Boingo, Boingo is a band you were going to be the front man and you were going to sing was that something you had done up to that yeah point? in the mystic nights i was already singing uh, most of the songs but i was singing like cab calloway and yeah. like crazy shit like that but um i was still singing at that point Did, were, so you were comfortable as a singer you were comfortable using your voice yeah well, no, yes and no. I mean, I was, I've never been comfortable in front of an audience, but I was comfortable singing. What was the band in your mind going to be? I mean, was it was it going to be sort of, in again, in that tradition, a little bit of the Mystical Knights and that it was... No. No. We just, we'd, we'd wanted to be just the opposite of the Mystic Knights. It's like the idea of having all this theater and theatrics for all these years. The appeal for me was having a band that could set up in... 20 minutes, 15 minutes, be ready, up and play. Yeah. That's it. Amps, drums, nothing else. Uh, suddenly it was like, strip it down to the opposite extreme. The Mystic Nights was like a truckload of stuff that had to happen and days of setup to do a show by the time we ended. And Oingo Boingo was designed, we could throw up our stuff at uh, Chinatown in a tiny club, squeeze onto a tiny stage and just be ready to play in 15, 20 minutes. All right. You had come from this troupe that was definitely not earnest at all. It was it was making it was parody. It was making fun. It was having fun. It was laughing. Was was your approach to Oingo Boingo? I mean, I know you were influenced by ska, and there were also bands out there like Devo and um, you know some the Specials and in certain in Southern California there were Fishbone and others that were that were popular. Was the idea that it was going to be a serious band, or was it also a, designed to be a bit tongue in cheek, in your view? I have no idea. Uh, there really wasn't any design other than just get up there and play. Just play. Yeah, I mean, it was just energy. It was just pure. The same thing that really motivates most bands to get together and play, which is just you got a bunch of hyperactive, energetic people that just need to get together and play. You know, when I heard the ska music out of England, I was really inspired because it reminded me of the high life I used to hear in West Africa, hmm. but it had that additional hyperkinetic energy that, that that's what appealed to me. I heard the madness and the specials and selector, 
and uh, and as as you said, Devo and XTC, you know, these were other bands at the same time, and I just was like, oh yeah, this definitely is like what I want to do. You guys became you were selling out shows in L.A. pretty quickly. Well, yeah, but you got to realize it was a very vibrant club scene. Yeah, and we were playing clubs every single weekend. So, you know, we we were just got into that club circuit of the L.A. rock clubs. And um, so we were just playing and playing and playing and playing. And every weekend, you know, a little more audience, a little more audience, a little yep. more audience. And then we uh, opened for a tour for the police. And, uh, and then things picked up quite a wow. bit more again. One of the most exciting nights for me was that one of the shows, we were like the second opening act. And the first primary opening act was XTC, wow. uh, which I was like a huge fan of. So it was like, that was like, really, oh my God, we're on stage yeah. at XTC. And, and you're one of the rare people to have seen them live because Andy Partridge hates performing live. Oh yeah, I, I followed that very closely. And, uh, and I also understood where he was coming from because I wrestled with a lot of the same demons. Did, did you really? I always had stage fright. Wow. I never got over it, even, even now. Even though you didn't give a shit what critics thought of your music, you didn't no, care about there's the a whole judgment. Different thing. This is hmm. not about judgment at all. What's Stage it about? fright is a mental condition. It's like an uneasiness being in front of people. In other words, I never had like an easy relationship with getting on stage in front of an audience. It's always been a, a difficult thing. Before every show, part of me wanted to like bolt and run away and wow. just leave the building. And then I would do it. And then somewhere during the show, I would click in and then, okay, I'm here now. I'm, I'm, I'm in the moment. Yeah. We used to have uh, the Chili Peppers open for us before they were famous. Actually, before they were even the Chili Peppers, you know, in, in a couple different names. But I remember seeing Flea backstage, you know, at the amphitheater. And just before he goes off, he goes off to the side of the stage, throws up, and then walks out and plays. Wow. And it's like, I don't do that, but I understand that. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I get it. There's this part of me, it's like, you don't want to fucking go in front of all these people and do this stuff. It's like, this is, you want the opposite. You want to hide in a shadow. And uh, that's my natural inclination is like hide, reclusive. And when you're wired that way, you have to force yourself through a kind of a, a barrier yeah. to actually get out there and get off of so much adrenaline that, you know, you're not going to have your head explode. So you really didn't want to be a rock and roll star. You, you, I mean, it's starting to make no. sense of how your career would go, but you did not want to be that thing, that person. No, I, I loved writing and I loved performing my music. And the thing is, in the middle of the show, there'd be a point where I'd be covered with sweat yeah. and right up in their faces. And I loved these moments where I feel totally connected. You know, I'd jump out on the audience. I was like, my shirt would get ripped off and have scratch marks on my back. <laughs> you know, I loved this contact, yeah. this interaction, but it still didn't stop the constant sense of I have a hard time in front of people. Yeah. I mean, I know it was very different from the Mystic Knights of the Oingo Boingo, but there's an element of that provocative street theater in what you brought to Oingo Boingo. Well, it's true. I mean, I did like provoking angry responses. That did please me. Did you like it because it sort of fueled your creativity or, or why did you? No, I liked it because I was a brat. <laughs> yeah. But they're probably connected. Maybe. Probably. So as this band that you, you were a reluctant frontman or a reluctant star became bigger and bigger and really developed a, a, a significant cult following. I mean, Oingo Boingo has been called like the biggest cult band <laughs> you know, ever. I mean, that you never were, had a hit record, I know. But but you were playing, I mean, you guys were playing massive to the Universal Amphitheater in, in Universal Studio. No, no, we, we, you know, we got to the point where it's like we were always playing the big shows here in Southern California, yeah. and even as far as Denver and Salt Lake City. And that was hard for me because I think as a performer, I was happiest in the clubs. Yeah. 
you know, you get in the whiskey a go go, and it's like a giant sauna, and you're crammed in there with 350 or 400 kids in a capacity of 250, and that kind of like sweat box energy was where I was most at home. Yeah. Then suddenly we're headlining Universal Amphitheater and Pacific Amphitheater and and uh, Irvine Meadows and you know these different places. It, it was difficult because I was struggling to kind of get that in your face connection. What did your um, What did your dad make of it? Seeing his son play these massive venues. It it caused him a lot of pride. I was really glad he lived long enough because you got to realize two school teachers raising a street musician who's passing the hat is not a happy situation. And uh, the fact that I never went back to college caused him a lot of anxiety. So to live long enough to see me headlining the Universal Amphitheater was a great moment for me. You got to realize I once found in my house a trumpet in a closet. And I asked my mom, I goes, who's trumpet? Goes, oh, that was your dad. I wow. go, really? Wow. I said, oh, yeah, that's when I met your dad. He was a trumpet player, big band trumpet player. And I learned that he came to California to hit it in the music business as a trumpet player. And he wanted to be a songwriter, too. And he didn't succeed. And eventually, you know, came back from the war and said, oh, this is crazy. I'm going to get my degree and get into teaching. And he never looked back. He never mentioned it to us. He never talked about it. And I asked him, I said, Dad, you were a big band trumpet player. He goes, oh, that was a long time ago. Uh, that doesn't matter. That was a long time ago. He, he never spoke of it. But I guess I fulfilled his dream years later. And I think that was a source of pleasure for him. So even though I didn't get the education, he got to see me in front of, you know, thousands of kids living the dream that he probably once had as a young man. And I, w I was very happy that he got to experience that. So, I mean... It sounds like, on the one hand, you you were experimenting, creating music with Oingo Boingo, and that was sort of the direction you were headed in, even though you were somewhat reluctant to, to kind of do that role. You release Dead Man's Party in 1985. It becomes the biggest album. But that same year, you're also asked to score a film. Tim Burton he was come, big adventure. Yeah, comes and asks you to score a film. But this was not in the cards. Like, you're, you're thinking, no. I'm going to... Be, you're going to do this band. This is this is how I'm going to make a living. Yeah, I'm just, you know, but two things were happening by 1985. Well, three things. One, my daughter Molly was born. Right. Two, it's like I released this album. That's our most popular album. Three, I'm asked to score my first real orchestral score and, uh, you know, be a real film composer. And four, I was reaching the point where I kind of wanted to not be in a band anymore. So I, I really had all these things kind of competing at me, uh, with me. And um, let's just say it was a very big year in my life. You're in your early 30s, and yeah. you're kind of thinking, maybe this isn't the thing I want to do. And and, and does, I mean, does the Tim Burton thing come out of the blue? I mean, he, he totally was, he's, he's going to make this film, Pee Wee's Big Adventure. And had you known him? Did you know he liked your music? How did it no, happen? No, I'd, I'd never met him until we met uh, for our meeting about Pee Wee's Big Adventure. And uh, Tim knew Oingo Boingo. He grew up out in Southern California. So he knew me from my band. And Paul Rubens knew me from Forbidden Zone. And wow. so Paul had already marked down like a note, like, oh, if I ever do a movie, I'd like to get this guy. And Tim was kind of like, oh, yeah, I've been to his shows. I think he's really, you know, I really dig his stuff. But when I asked him, when I met him, why me? He just goes, I don't know. I think you could do a film score. I said, you're crazy. Uh, but I looked at some scenes from the movie. I looked at the movie and I went home and I wrote a piece of music on my four track tape player and made a cassette tape, sent it to him. And I never expected to hear back from them. Yeah. And I got the job. And that piece of music became the titles to Pee Wee's Big Adventure, actually. I mean... It, when you hear it now, it's just, it's perfect. It's got the, the horn from the bike and it sounds like he's on the bike and it's got, it's a cartoonish, but, and that film was so unusual because it was a kid's film, but it was also quite subversive. And when he came to you and he said, hey, you know, can you do this? You're thinking this is not going to be used. I'm not capable of doing this. I'm not qualified. Yeah. I mean, I, I said, I'll do it. You want me to do it, I'll do it, because it'll be a good experience for me. Right. And Warner Brothers will no doubt throw out the score and hire a real composer to come in and do it. 
So that that was my expectation. And and had he already shot the film? Did he? Were you able to yeah, see the, the film? Yeah, the film was done. So yeah. he you basically you came in and you were able to see a, an unscored film. Right. And so how did you begin? What do you remember about figuring out how to make that come alive? Well, I just remember the opening scene with the bike race. Yes. It reminded me of kind of like a a nineteen an early. European kind of crazy comedy you know there is yeah. something about it reminded me of this could be like an Italian or a French comedy with opening with a bike race with this crazy character yeah. with the suit and uh, so I just was immediately connected with I'll score it as if it's like an Italian or comedy and so I just went right to that this was obviously before digital audio was widely available, right? And what, what was available was very expensive. So all those sounds that you were using, I mean, how did you think about integrating them? Were you, you, were you thinking about this as a sort of a live action cartoon? Not really. I just, I just wrote what I thought fit what I was seeing. And um, I turned to Nina Rota as an inspiration because there was just that crazy European sensibility, but you know, it could have been anything. You know, I, I didn't mention in my earlier years, I was from the point that I saw the day the earth stood still and heard that Bernard Herrmann score, I became a fan of film music. Yeah. So by the time I was in my 20s, I was one of these nerdy film music kind of fans, you know, and I could recognize the difference between a Jerry Goldsmith score and a score that, you know, it's like, oh, wait a minute, isn't that, that sounds like Eric Korngold, and uh, I'd be really happy. It's like, yeah, Franz Waxman, Bernard Herrmann, Alex North, you know, and I would try to, like, play that game with myself of, like, who's the composer of some score that I would hear, and so I had a pool of musical database that I definitely was drawing on. So it's not like I was going to square one going, what if, what does film music sound like? Yeah. I just was like drawing on stuff that I loved, you know, it's like, okay, Mancini, uh, Nina Rota, a little Marconi, a little Bernard Herrmann, you know, it's just, this is just music I love. And, you know, it's funny that when I started out, all the younger composers, my own age, you know, hated my guts, but the older guys were actually kind of sweet. And after Batman came out and, um, you know, the Academy Awards were nominated, I got a telegram and it says, it's just, you was robbed, Hank. Wow. And I call my agent. I go, I don't know any Hank. Who sent me this telegram? And he goes, you idiot. That's Henry Mancini. Wow. I that's said, amazing. Well, I never met him, never spoke with him. And just what a sweet thing what to do. What a sweet thing to do. Yeah. Exactly. Because he was... A gentleman, you know, he was just a sweet guy. And he, he wasn't, it seemed like the older guys weren't as rattled by my existence as the younger guys were. Yeah. And in fact, I partially owe my uh, film composing career to the fact that I was so detested when I started out in the industry. Uh, that really motivated me quite a bit. I mean, if, I, if they'd have loved me, I don't think I would have gotten as good as I got or certainly have gone as far as I went. Yeah. The fact that they hated me really fueled me because every score I wrote for a Tim Burton movie, you know, from Pee Wee's Big Adventure on, you know, so Beetlejuice, Batman, Edward Scissorhands, Nightmare Before Christmas, all of these movies was just another fuck you. And um, check it out, you know? Yeah. And um, I was really constantly trying to prove myself against a lot of like, he doesn't write his own music, he just hums, he has other people do it, right. we'll find them eventually, whoever's yep. actually doing it. You know, that's what I was up against for a decade. And I loved it because it just got my blood going and motivated me. You were essentially a, a pretty well-known rock and roll, I mean, let's just say rock and roll, even though the genre is not exactly right. And I know you, this was a, a sort of a point of contention for you that, that Oingo Boingo, you've said, didn't have an identity in your view. But that was what your identity was to others, right? As a front man right. for a band. And all of a sudden, you have this movie that you've scored. And did you right. think when it came out, hang on, this this could be the thing that I kind of do. And this could be like my my, my lily pad. I could jump into this lily pad and move in this well, direction. When I heard the orchestra playing the first cue of on the scoring of stage, the Pee of the Pee Wee's Big Adventure, okay, yeah. that bicycle race, I remember right then and there thinking, 
oh shit, this is cool. Yeah. Your and, your uh, notes, the things you wrote down on paper, they're playing. They're playing. And I'd never stood in front of an orchestra before. I didn't know what an orchestra sounded like. And it was pretty addictive. I always describe it. That was kind of like my first shot of heroin, you know, the, yeah. the one you get for free <laughs> before you get hooked. And um was kind of Pee Wee's big adventure. So when I came out of Pee Wee and the score wasn't thrown away, and then to my great astonishment, it actually opened up getting about 100 offers immediately. Um, I mean, it was like in the, every successful composer's story, there's a lucky break. Yeah. You know, it's there's persistence. You'll always hear there's persistence. And of course, you have to have a certain amount of talent, but there's also a lucky break. The lucky break for me was Pee Wee coming out just exactly when it did. Comedy music in the 80s was in a bit of a lull. People hmm. didn't quite know what to do with comedy scores. A lot of them were jazzy, big band kind of scores right. and or small ensembles. And I just did this kind of crazy score. And immediately I was offered like every quirky comedy made in Hollywood. I mean, it was crazy. I didn't even expect the score to survive. And here I am. It just swung a door open. Yeah. And now people were going, oh, we want that peewee sound. This is also the beginning of a very, very fruitful relationship between you and Tim Burton. I mean, he, he right. also, I mean, on the one hand, yes, he approached you and that kind of changed everything. But it it, it, it was like it, it, there was a big possibility that it wouldn't have worked. Like he could have talked to another composer and it wouldn't have worked. Like uh, There's a hundred things that could have gone right? wrong. Right. Like there. what was it about your sensibilities that just matched and continue to match to this day? I don't know. Other than we're both oddballs that connected. You know, he, like myself, was a monster kid. He grew up in Southern California on monster movies. So when we met, there was kind of this connection of, his idol was Vincent Price. Yeah. Mine was Peter Lorre. And we both knew all the movies the other one had seen because we kind of grew up on the same films. So there was a kind of a connection there. And more to the point, I think we're similarly odd personalities because, you know, people keep saying to me, how do you know what to do for these weird films that he gives you? And yeah. I would say, well, they don't seem that weird to me. <laughs> I mean, it, it's not hard finding what to put in these movies for me. From that point, right, then you would go on to do some pretty high-profile films, Beetlejuice, Scrooged, back to school just in those few years after Pee-wee. Well, How I was did... trying to do at least one or two films every year along with Oingo Boingo. So I had 10 years where I did both. Yeah. But I really wanted to learn. The only way you get good at being a composer, a film composer... Is by doing it. it by doing it. And so I just was hungry to get anything. And I would tell, you know, I got an agent very quickly, who I'm still my agent. And I would say, just get me a film. I'm yeah. available this month or available. I'll be available in September or I'll be available in April between tours and between recording. And he would find me a film. And every time I did a film, I tried to get myself to do something I hadn't done yet. And there's a point where Tim was doing a film every two years. But I was doing four films between each of his. Wow. So, like, Beetlejuice was number five. You know, Pee Wee was one. Beetlejuice was five. Batman was 10. Um, Edward almost was 15. It was 14. But, um, and he'd go, how are you doing all these films between my films? And I would tell him, I said, Tim, unless I do these scores between each of your films, I'm not going to have the technical ability to step up with you. Wow. Because your films are getting more complex also. How did you hone your approach to writing music. So, for example, let's take Beetlejuice. I mean, Harry Belafonte is such a prominent part of that film, right? Those those Harry Belafonte songs. But then the score that you write for that film is so also so prominent in the film. Well, what, I mean, uh, my, my approach to the film scoring was just very much like it was towards Oingo Boingo as a band. It was just like, get in your face, you know, and don't worry about what genre you're fitting in. Just like, be a great... Everything was aggressive because I just had too much energy. <laughs> and uh, so I kind of applied that same energy to the film composing. And uh, I just got aggressive. I didn't give a shit what anybody thought except the director. And, you know, I said, if the audience likes this or hates it, whatever. As long as it doesn't get thrown out, I'm good. Yeah. But how did you begin to develop what is now your approach to a film? You get somebody says, Danny, I want you to score my film. 
And and how I mean, are you like an anthropologist? Do you go visit the set? Do you start to read material about the movie? How do you think about creating that sound? Because the sound really it's like salt on a tomato that's not has no taste. You need that salt to bring it alive, and that's what the music does. Generally speaking, I don't start thinking about a score until I see a first rough cut of the film. Right. Because whatever I think it's going to be, it's not. And I learned that very early on on Beetlejuice. You know, I had an extra month before I started. And I said, I'm going to start to pre-write music just from the script and what I think it's going to be. And I wrote all this music and none of it made it in the film. It didn't make sense. No, as soon as I saw the film, I go, I get it. Now I get it. Because what I was imagining was a different film. And I found that that's often the case. It's really the style of the film, the visuals, the how it's shot, the acting, the performance, the lighting, how it's edited. All these things tell you what type of score to do. So I started reverse technique. When I see a film for the first time, I try to blank my mind out of any preconceived notion of what I think it might be musically. You know, the television screen in the beginning of Poltergeist? Yeah. It's just the white noise of just static. That's how I try to put my mind when I'm going to see anything for the first time. I don't want any sense of, it's going to be this, or it's going to be this, or I'm thinking like this type of thing. I I want nothing. I want to see it and then see what I start to feel from it. You know, when you talked about your work with Oingo Boingo or your work with um, the Mystic Knights, you, you very clearly didn't care what critics or fans thought. You were just putting things out there that you had fun doing, you enjoyed doing. But I'm wondering when it came to a film and when it comes to a film, it's somewhat different because you are part of making that thing come alive. And, and like Batman without the score that you wrote wouldn't be the same film. Well, but and you, so you when... have to bend yourself to find the psyche into the psyche of the director because it is no longer just this thing that you're doing totally on your own. I mean, I had a sensibility and I didn't care like really what f- film critics or you know, even the producers in most cases like they like it, they not like it as long right. as the director likes it. That's essential. If the director doesn't like what you do, it's not going in the movie. So you have to work with the director and I learned that Right from the beginning, you know, part of the half the skill of being a film composer is to do your own thing, find your own voice through the eyes of the director. So you have to get into their head. You have to be kind of a psychologist in a way and get into their mindset and then find your own expression through their personality. When we come back after a quick break, Danny shares how he made the difficult decision to leave the production of Tim Burton's Batman, only to come back to it stronger than ever. Stay with us. I'm Guy Raz, and you're listening to The Great Creators. Welcome back to The Great Creators. I'm Guy Raz. So in the 1980s, Danny Elfman began gaining more and more recognition as a composer for some pretty offbeat, out-there films like Pee-wee's Big Adventure and Beetlejuice. But in 1989, Danny took on a project that was about as different from those as you could get, a mainstream superhero movie. You've said that the Batman score rates as the most difficult and challenging movie experience you ever had in your life. That score was huge, orchestral, almost elements of, of, you know, sort of John Williams kind of orchestral score in that film. And and is it true? Would you still call it the most difficult and challenging? Well, it was the most difficult project. You know, like projects have their own life aside from the music. Yeah. So musically, it was very challenging because I'd never done a dark film, a big film. I'd not done all comedies before Batman. I'd only done nine scores and they were all comedy. And Batman was obviously a, a bigger, more challenging project. Yeah. And it's funny, you mentioned John Williams, but the only thing we knew we didn't want it to be was John Williams. <laughs> because the, the the hard part with Batman is there was no model. Yeah, The only superhero we had to go on was Superman. And Tim, from the very beginning, we said, we do not want it to sound like Superman. You know, love John Williams to death, but not for this film. Right, because Batman was the first super, real superhero movie of the modern superhero era, I think, right? I 
I'm not a so. film historian, but it was from my perspective. Uh, yeah, yeah. That was all we had to go on was Superman. From the early and 80s. So I had to find a language that didn't exist. Hmm. And But more to the point, um, I had huge uh, adverse difficulty in the producers and the studio and the process where I had to actually move off the film for a while and then back on again. So it was just extremely challenging on every level. You know, the producer, John Peters, originally, as he told me when we walked through the set of Gotham City and with my music editor listening very carefully to our conversation and moving between us because he was afraid there was going to be a fight, um, he's saying, so Danny, I think we get the best musical people involved that we possibly can. Michael Jackson will write the Batman theme, Prince will write the Joker's theme, and George Michaels will write the love theme for Vicki Vale. And I said, what'll I do? And I, he'll go, you can be the captain of the ship. And now I'm starting to get dark and go, I don't like boats. And Bob Batamy, our music editor, was moving between us, very consciously moving us apart because especially, you know, John Peters had a very volatile temper, but so did I. I mean, literally when we met, the first thing he said is, you box, don't you? You know, like, as if, let's go a couple rounds. I go, no, 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 I, I, I box, I'm into boxing, I train, but I don't go in the ring, you know? I've done boxing my whole life, but just training. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a whole different thing. I don't like he people hitting me. <laughs> and so, but he was afraid and I did kind of feel my blood coming up like, what the fuck? Yeah. And it did get to the point where they wanted Prince to collaborate and be co-written the score. And I, I refused and I had to leave the movie. As much as I loved Prince, I didn't want to be his orchestrator, which is right. what I felt would have happened. And he went off and wrote a score and they played it and I got brought back on the picture. So it was brutally hard on me because I felt like I just left the biggest opportunity of my life. I walked away from it and ended my career. Wow. And I felt that for almost a month of like, I just killed myself. I just shot myself because of my own pig headedness and inability to like be part of the club. And, and then it worked out. But in hindsight, I go, what what luck? Yeah, I mean, because it's amazing. I mean, you you walk away. They said, all right, well, fine. We'll let Prince do it. At that yeah, point, exactly. I bet at that point, anyone would have thought, okay, well, there you go. There's a score. But but Prince's score just wasn't right for the film, so they bring you back on. Right. And I have to say, by the end, John Peters, when he actually heard the orchestra playing the piece for the first time, he was jumping up and down. He was like picking up the phone and calling people and playing it over the speaker of the phone. Wow. And he became like a huge supporter, but it was hard fought because yeah. he went from skeptic, Danny, you don't know how to do this kind of film. And we have other people who could do better to like, I love this. And he became like a real advocate, but it, it was just it, up to that point, every film I'd done was a small film under the radar I never even met producers, leastwise worked with them or anybody else. It was just me and the director, Tim Burton or whoever else it was. That's it. And suddenly I'm embroiled in all this intense stuff. And um, I do feel like I just lucked out because it could have easily have turned the other way. And that could have also been the end of my career. You know, I've read about um, this encounter you had with Matt Groening, uh, who, of course, created The Simpsons, and he asked you to come up with a theme. And apparently you wrote it in, like, on the way home in your car. You recorded yeah. a demo and sent it in. So that, to me, is 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 one story, right, of of just maybe this comes into your head, do 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 The whole do, thing, top to bottom. You know, do And but sometimes, or maybe more than sometimes— it's, it has to be a struggle. It has to be like birthing a child. Well, to, l l let me put it this way. Yeah. Nine out of 10 times, if not 19 out of 20 times, it's a big struggle. Every now and then, it just happens easy. But as you're implying, it yeah. usually is closer to giving birth. I mean, there are many films I've finished that were so grueling, the process of getting the score done on schedule, that... I did feel like I'll never do this again. I'll never wow. do this again. But like your metaphor of giving birth tends to happen is, you know, uh, 
I will never have another baby. You know, this is like, I never want to go through this again until you see the baby born and then starting to grow up and you go, oh my God, she's so cute. He's so cute. And then they go, you know, maybe I can do this one more time. Yeah. What happens is at a certain point, the, the prize, the baby ends up becoming more powerful experience than the unpleasantness <laughs> of giving birth. And yeah. some films can be like that. I mean, they can just be brutal warfare of just logistically trying to accomplish the task. And you're so exhausted by the end of it that you go, that's it. Life's too short. I don't want to do this anymore. But then it comes out and you see it in the theater and you suddenly go, I actually like the way the score came out. Maybe I'll do, maybe I'll do it again. In terms of sound, right, and and kind of shaping sound to match or to elevate an image, are you do you do you just have like a database in your head of just you know I don't know an infinite number of sounds or instrumentations that you draw from that you think oh, can this might work? Like, how do you actually when you're sitting down? First of all, do you sit down in front of a keyboard or an instrument? Yeah, I sit down in front of a, I have a keyboard in front of me right now and two monitors. One of them is my uh, software that I'm composing on. And the other is the movie that I'm watching. And uh, So you're watching so, a scene and you're like... Mm, yeah, and I've, okay. I, I'll have built a template for that scene. Uh, if it's an orchestral score, I'll have like hundreds of orchestral sounds, you know, that I've already pre-laid out. And if it's a synthesizer score, I'll have hundreds of synthesizer sounds there. And sometimes it's both. So I create a template that I think is a good wide palette of sounds to work with for this particular film. And then I just start in. When do you know it's right? You don't. It's right when it's over. You know, the the thing is with movies, you run out of time and that's when it's right. Yeah. I mean, you just – because I, I imagine we you see a film, right, like like Big Fish or whatever, any Tim Burton movie that you've scored, right, um, or, or The Night Before Christmas or Silver Linings Playbook. I mean, and most people, unless the music is so – you know, like in The Nightmare Before Christmas, unless it's so – central you don't think about it often but but when you do to to most moviegoers it just seems seamless and simple and yet i can't imagine how challenging it is to even write 45 seconds of music and and you're talking about writing an hour of music right for a film or more well or dr strange two hours of music but um yeah, it's, I don't know how to describe it other than you just learn how to maneuver and time things the way you want it to. And, you know, you have to have instincts that are good for that. And I learned on Pee-wee's Big Adventure that I had good instincts for finding the rhythm of an editor, of an edit, and finding which feel kind of locks into this edit well. And Because um, it's an editorial process too. You are making editorial decisions about how you... Yeah, it, it's very, very technical, but it's also very artistic. You don't think about it when you're a composer. You don't think, how am I going to, how am I going to? You just like dive in and you just start wrestling with it and you find your way. You know, you just dive in and find your way. You know, you mentioned how early on you had to do all these films. Tim Burton said, how, how can you make all these films in between my films? And you said, in order for me to make better music for your next film, I have to do all this stuff because I'm not going to get better. And I wonder if that is what led you to also start to compose works for stage, for orchestras, right? Because you, you've now done four or five commissioned pieces I think, uh, yeah, I think I'm on my, I have my seventh next week in London. Is a part of that that you had to do that because... Yeah, I had to do it because I reached a point like I was with Oingo Boingo where I needed to expand. I had to get out of the band or I'd go crazy. Yeah. And I felt the same way with film music. It's like I love writing film music, but it's also very constraining because I have to write for the film and I need to break out of that and... Almost more to the point, I need to challenge myself and get out of my comfort zone because there's a certain point where it's like, okay, I've done 100 films. Now I've done 110 films, you know? Wow. It's like, I understand what I'm doing. I need to do something that I don't understand that's harder. Because I was doing concerts of film music all around the world for the yeah. last 
decade. Yeah. And I was like, the challenge is coming up with a concert piece that has no film recognition. So when people are coming to hear the music, they're not coming to hear the music because I love that film. They're coming just because of the music. I said, wow, that would be a real challenge. So it was inevitable that I had to take that on. But you did decide to test your comfort level because in 2020, you decided, I think I'm going to go and do live shows. And you, 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 you said no to all these film requests. And you said, I'm going to focus on making a, a live show and I'm going to perform. Laura Ingle, my manager, had mm-hmm. been trying to get me out to Coachella for over a decade. As or, or film scores, Oingo Boingo, to do, to do like, what? Well, at that point, it would be Oingo Boingo stuff. And it's like, no, I don't want to do a reunion yeah. thing. It just doesn't feel right to me. Yeah. And then it was like, oh, you know, Hans Zimmer did this film thing, do a film night. And I go, no, that doesn't feel right hmm. to me either. Because I've been doing film nights already. But to do it on a rock stage means you have to use a lot of pre-recorded music. And it just didn't feel... Yeah. It just wasn't where I'm at. You know, when I do an orchestral concert, you know, I have 120 players on stage. You wow. can't do that at Coachella. No. Okay. So Paul Tallette, who'd been trying to get me out there for a while, arranged to like bring me out there. And um, I saw the screens and I heard the show and it was like the visual part got me excited. I was so impressed by the technology you know and the last time i'd been to a big outdoor show there was nothing like that these yeah. giant hundred foot high definition mega screens yeah and i said i'm interested but i can't do a film night because that's not right and i'm not interested in a boingo night how about if i mix it all together if I make a crazy mashup of stuff that has no business being together on the single stage, old stuff, new stuff, orchestral stuff, and rock band, but at least 50% of it has to be live rock band. So you would be goes, singing part of it, and part of it you would you would be playing That was my concept, but okay. my, my inspiration was I'll come up with some amazing visuals, put on those screens, okay. and really have fun, rock out with that side of myself. And By the way, Paul when you just, agreed to do this, did you have nerves in your stomach thinking, oh, God. And when I came up with the idea, I was just yeah. excited. Okay. But you I knew just, you were going to have to be in front of, you're going to have to be in front of 80,000 people. Well, that, that's later. The, okay. you know, the problem is you come up with an idea, you're excited. The reality <laughs> of it is a big problem, but that's down the line. Right. And Paul just immediately said, yeah, let's do it. All right. And so Laura and I began organizing this incredibly complicated show. And... Um, At the point where my nerves were becoming like, what the hell have I done? This is insane. It all canceled, of course, because of COVID. COVID. So part of me was like massively disappointed because, you know, for months Mm. I'd been working on this show. And part of me was, oh, thank God, because that would have been a disaster. (laughs) And so come 2020... You know, it's like, so they're doing Coachella again, but no, they've already announced it's a different lineup. Probably, you know, they're just probably moved on. And suddenly we get the call. Come on, we still want you to do this show. And it's like, oh man, now I'm just as behind as I was the first time. This is for 2022. 2022. But now I've already come out with a new album. So it's like, okay. So instead of just having potentially one or two new songs to do a world premiere, which was the idea for 2020, because I'd already written this song that I said I'd, I'd just be great. I love the idea of premier, opening with this crazy song called Sorry. And um, just seeing the audience going, what the fuck is going on? I mean, that's a priceless Because they didn't look. know, they wouldn't know the song, right? They have no, they'd be like, who, what's the song? I know, I, I, where, where, where's Only a Lad? Where's Weird Science? You come out exactly. and sing Okay. <laughs> and so now I have a whole album out. So I kind of, instead of going half and half, old material and and film material, I was one-third, one-third, one-third. Okay, one-third big mess, one-third new, one-third old from refurbished Boingo stuff, and one-third film music. And they're so different. I mean, Big Mess, I should mention, is a record that you wrote during the pandemic, and it is completely different than your orchestral work, than your film scores, than your even than your Oingo Boingo stuff. Yeah. I mean, in a way, it's kind of combining it all together because... You know, the the first song I did, Sorry, was an experiment in combining orchestra and rock band. I've heard you describe yourself in the third person, like you're you're different, you're two different artists inside of you. There's like two different, I don't know, maybe they're not even Danny Elfman. They're just like some creatures inside of you that are producing completely different kinds of music. And yeah. 
And Definitely. And it always was that way. Yeah. Ha- explain that. I mean, because the, the, the music on, on your new album, Big Mess, it's it's radical. I mean, there's, there's songs in there that are clearly, you know, they're kick me, I'm an arrogant, selfish asshole. I'm the Iggy Pop song that, that came out and uh, the song called Happy, which is certainly a dystopian, scary song. And there's a, but then you're writing these lush orchestral pieces too. And so how do you... Well, yeah. It was like, it was a wrestling match because the thing that frustrated me back with, when I was with Oingo Boingo is already I was at war with myself. Hmm. And part of me liked writing these up-tempo, fun, dancey songs. And yeah. part of me really wanted to write more challenging stuff. But in a band, you can't keep switching it up. Right. It's almost like I wanted to be in a different band every two years. But, you know, you're performing for an audience that just doesn't work. Right. And it got frustrating more and more. And I found that as a film composer, exactly that conflict worked perfectly because in film, you can bounce from one extreme to the other that you can't do when you're in a band. You know, I could write something crazy, fast, driving, intense, and I could write something more melodic and lush and harmonically challenging. And so they both got their turn. So when Big Mess started, these two rivals had 35 years of like waiting their turn. Yeah. <laughs> and then I started writing songs again and they weren't going to wait at all. Yeah. In April of 2022, you did in fact perform at Coachella. You got a lot of attention for that show. Going there as a 68-year-old man versus yeah. a 30, you know, early, you know, a guy in his early 30s at uh, in Oingo Boingo or your late 20s. Was it easier for you to perform in front of a large audience at that point? Were you okay? Was it oh, less? Oh, God, no. No. I mean, it wasn't. It Even was... with all of your accomplishments and, and Emmy and Oscar well, nominations no. and film scores. It doesn't scores. matter. You got to get up there and perform. So mm. I already had to work through part of it because I'd been performing Nightmare Before Christmas songs for about eight years at that point. Yeah. And you sing, um, and, and you sing as Jack Skellington. Yeah, but yeah. that was a huge hurdle. Because I'd not sung for 18 years, yeah. and I had to come out on Albert Hall in London and, and sing, sing songs Jack from Nightmare Skellington, Before Christmas, right. and I almost couldn't do it. Hmm. I mean, I literally had a moment where I froze up wow. at the stage door, and I was backstage with Helena Bonham Carter was singing Sally that yeah. night, and she's on the floor behind me. She's looking at me, and she goes, Denny, what's going on? I go, and I said, I don't think I can go out there. Wow. And... She gave me the best advice ever. She just said, Denny, what the fuck? And I was like, oh, my God, thank you. (laughs) I mean, that's been... Those three words have been like the story of my life. And why should it be different now? And I just said, I went out there. I was like, what the fuck? They're not going to kill me like I'm imagining. And I'm imagining myself getting... Pulled off the stage and tarred and feathered and paraded no, around London. They're going to you know? love you. They came there to see you. It was one of the best nights of performing I ever had because I had to mm. work through so much demons to get out there. Well, now I'm backstage at Coachella. And okay, getting out there and singing, I've done that. But yeah. I've not sung as myself in 30-something years. Right, because you've sung as a character, right, Jack? I've sung as a character. Okay, yeah. But more to the point... I thought the show that I'd created was going to be a train wreck. I thought it was going to be a disaster. (laughs) So more than any point in my life, I was walking, pacing around backstage before the show at Coachella, hoping they were at 35 minutes to set up 50 players on stage and the band and the orchestra and the singers and maybe get mics on them that are going to work. Maybe. And... I'm just thinking I'm about to step into a train that I know is going to speed down the tracks to a bridge that has a hundred foot gap in it. And I'm going off Mm. into the cliffs. Mm. I said, I'm about to crash and burn in a train wreck of my own design. And then on top of it, I step out there and it's a dust storm (laughs) and I couldn't hear myself in my ear monitors because that just the sound, it really was right around a third of the way into the show I was finally like come on Danny get your mind wrapped around this thing you know you're almost there and I know that sounds really stupid but for 17 years of Oingo Boingo I was most of the time I was barefoot shirtless in nothing but shorts that's how I was that's how I loved it 
Yeah. I just felt sweaty and raw and exposed. So I took my shirt off and threw it out in the crowd like I used to with Oingo Boingo every night for 17 years. And suddenly, I felt like I was there. Huh. And that I don't give a shit. I'm just going to enjoy this kind of hit me and propelled me through the rest of the set. I couldn't tell if anybody was hearing me. I couldn't tell if the sound system was on. I couldn't tell if the band was playing, you know, and I was, I mean, I couldn't tell anything. And at that point I said, I don't give a shit. I'm just gonna like do the best I can, try to follow the beat. I mean, following the beat was no simple thing. When I stepped out there for the sound check, Josh hit the first kick drum and it was like a thunderclap. Mm on stage like nothing in i'd heard in rehearsal and i said what the fuck and the sound man says you're standing on like a hundred subwoofers and they're right underneath you so it it was an incredible experience has it has it changed how you've thought about i mean now it's it's you can't stop doing that right you got to keep keep doing it right perhaps yeah i mean uh in the end it, it it just came out better than I was hoping. And um, yeah, it did feel good being out there. And I felt good that I really was rattling people, that it wasn't the show they were expecting. And I couldn't tell, are they into it? Do they love it? Do they hate it? I have no idea. And it wasn't until I got off stage that I started like, oh my God, online, you know, like people are just going on about the show. And I'm going, I didn't know until that moment that anybody could even hear me. Yeah. You you have um, I mean you are just unbelievably prolific. You're still composing all the time. I I don't think you I, I I just you don't strike me as somebody who can sit down and just relax. That you have to constantly produce stuff. So what I mean you know you've scored hundred and ten films and and orchestral pieces and. And, and have been the front man of a very successful band and now have a solo record and have performed at Coachella in front of tens of thousands of people, you're going to have to challenge yourself again based on everything that you've done to this point. Like you are going to get well, to a point soon again where you're like, I got to push myself again. What's that going to be? You look, there's so many areas to push myself into. First, you know, there's the question of, will I do another album? And if so, I want to do something very different again. Now, it's the world is open yeah. uh, to the possibilities of what I can do or try to do. And with the orchestral music on the other extreme, I mean, it's unlimited. Uh, you know, the amount of areas that I still want to push into to try for uh, improving myself as an orchestral, you know, symphonic composer is also boundless. I mean, honestly, if I thought I could live to be 150... I think I'd just be like working through the amount of things I feel like I want to do right now. So um, there's still so, so many things to challenge myself with in these venues, you know? But clearly you are, I mean, just there's a wellspring of creativity within you. And I wonder when you think about that, that concept, do you think that it's something that is accessible to anyone, that anyone can find it within themselves? Or do you think it's like a thing that just some people have and some people don't. I have no idea. I really don't, you know. I mean, I can only say with myself, it's compulsive and constant and, you know, as distorted my whole sense of living and life and how I live and everything about it has revolved around that obsessive need to, you know, keep going and pushing myself like I do. But um, where that falls in terms of any other human beings, I, I just have no idea. But it sounds like for you at least, in order to continue to grow creatively, you have to continue to produce. Like, like Yes, right? absolutely. That's what I am. And when I stop that, I have no doubt I'll die. That's Danny Elfman. Danny's most recent rock record, if you can call it that, is Big Mess. He has a song on it called Happy, which is not the Pharrell song. Actually, as far from that one as you can get. Check out a link for the very intense music video to the song. It's in the show notes for this episode. Go to thegreatcreators.com slash Elfman. And you can find all of our episodes at thegreatcreators.com. 
Hey, thanks so much for listening to our show this week. If you liked what you heard, please do tell someone about it. Share a link or a tweet or post a story and hashtag The Great Creators. You can find us on social media by searching The Great Creators. And I'm on TikTok as Guy Raz. Please spread the word and thanks. This episode was produced by Nat Hoops and edited by Michael May with help from Jeff Rogers. Thanks also to Kevin Leahy, Elaine Coates, Jenna Gedman, Andrea Bruce, Rebecca Spiro, Michelle Triant, and Daniel Shukin. I'm Guy Raz, and you've been listening to The Great Creators from Built It Productions. 